Award-winning author Erin Graffi is well known for her extensive writings and lectures on Santa Barbara. She has written more than 100 books, monographs, and articles on regional history and culture, the personalities, organizations, and events of our community. She is the historian for Old Spanish Days Fiesta and has been featured as a regional historian on CNN, Univision, and in the 2015 Tournament of Roses Parade. Her recent book, Old Spanish Days, Santa Barbara History Through Public Art, notice we conveniently scheduled her before Spanish Days, uh, was the recipient of two National Book Prizes for History and will be available for purchase after this lecture. Please join me in welcoming Erin Graffi. Mamma mia, are there any Italians in this place? <laughs> well, this topic is a lot of fun because, of course, we always think of um, Santa Barbara as a Spanish town or maybe a Mexican town. Uh, but it was until I got into researching and discovering about the Italians here, we had no idea how much the Italians had contributed to our little city and how many of them are and how extensive they were and how many things they did for this community. The Italian community itself, they knew each other, but they didn't know this all in context. So really the first question we have when we're starting out, let's see if this works, is why in the world somebody with a name like Aaron, Irish, Graffy, German, got into Italians? So it all started with, everything in Santa Barbara always starts with Pearl Chase, correct? Okay, so I was going to write a book about Pearl Chase. Um, Pearl Chase, of course, is not Italian. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, in the process of writing her history, and I've got all the dirt on early Pearl, and um, when she starts going back to you know, her childhood, but when she gets into adulthood and starts coming into her public life in Santa Barbara around the 1920s, these Italian names kept popping up over and over again as I'm researching documents and newspapers and all the rest of that. So one day, I remember this so clearly, I was at the Glen Hill Library at the Santa Barbara <clears throat> Historical Museum, and once again, more Italian names came up. So I literally just pushed Pearl over to the side and then thought, let's just take a look at some of these Italians. And it was completely arbitrary what name I started with and for you old timers here, or I shouldn't say old timers, for you long timers in Santa Barbara, you would know the name Marathi. There was a very, very pretty girl named Marathi. I don't know her from Adam, but she was in my oldest brother's class. So I started with the name Marathi and I just thought I'll look up Marathi and see what happens. And there was a, a, a Frank Marathi, okay, and I start investigating him and he's married to another Italian name. And, but then another Marathi showed up. And I went, oh, they must be brothers. No, it was a father's son. Okay, then another Marathi showed up, and it was a brother. Then another Marathi, and it turns out it was a cousin. Well, the next thing to keep them straight, I had to do sort of like a little family tree. I hope this will show up and read. So, that's only half of it. As you can see, all the Italians are related, so watch when you complain about one of them. <coughs> You see Garini's up here, uh, Visolini's up here, uh, Bocci's up here. Um, I can't read it all from back down here. So you can see there was a whole lot, but let's, let me just let you sink that in for a little bit and read that. Ripperetti, no, Rigetti. No, something begins with an R there. I can't see it from the side. And how about here's more, just when you thought you were finished. More and more and more of these Italian names related to each other, intermarried, cousin, second cousin. So I thought, you know, there's a lot of Italians in this town. <laughs> and I start poking around with this. And in fact, I remember going to my brother Neil and I said, you know, I was trying to write a book about Pearl Chase, but all these Italians kept showing up. And now I'm perplexed whether I should pursue the Italians or go back to Pearl Chase. And my brother wisely said, oh, everybody knows about Pearl Chase. Go after the Italians, because that's the unknown history. You can always pick up Pearl later, but you know, you're on a roll here, go for it. So that's how I started into our, uh, our Italians. Now, the next thing I discovered as I was collecting all these names, and I basically started going back through all the obituaries going back to 1950, anything that looked or sounded Italian, I collected those names. So this is where I was getting the information was from the family obituaries. And put that together and recognize 
when I had it in the database, then it really confirmed it, that there were really kind of five areas that the Italians in Santa Barbara came from. Let's take a look at that. There we have a juicy thing here. And you notice where they all come from, it looks like the cuff of the boot and further north. Now, at this point, as you're taking this all in, I had a sign that, I have to tell you a little family secret, not my family secret, but Italian family secret. Uh, as you're looking at all this, you're saying, um, wait a second, what's missing? What's missing? So Sicily. Now, when I was working on this, I didn't know that Italy had a pecking order, and this would be left over from the old centuries, the old world, because the very top of the boot would be in the continent of Europe. So you have a lot more action going on there. The people are more educated because things are going back and forth, more, uh, more urban, more sophisticated. And the further south that you get, people are away from all the hubbub, tends to be more rural, a little more out of it. And so there is this pecking order of Italy over Sicily and Northern Italy over Southern Italy. And the cream of the crop apparently is Piedmontese, Piedmont area. Well, I didn't know this when I'm first coming in because I'm just, you know, getting all these names together. And the Italian boot club used to have their Festa Italiana. Who remembers that? Yeah, uh, before it got, um, I guess the, the health department made so many regulations that we used to we close down all of those, um, those great events that we used to have at the park. So the Italian boot club said, why don't you have take a booth and collect all the stories? And I put this map up, so there's a little story about this that I'm telling about the family secret, is I put this up and it was actually fewer names on at that time. I just had maybe more household names in Santa Barbara that people would recognize. Some of these you know, are known in the Italian community, but not so well known. All right, so I have this sign up, big poster, and a woman comes up with her daughter. She was about maybe 50, 60 years old, the daughter, age, a uh, grown woman, and they were looking at this and they were giving me the evil eye, just glaring at me. So I'm new to all this and I brightly said, um, are there any questions I can answer? And she said, just like this, where is Sicily? <laughs> now, because I was young and naive, this was seven years ago, no, <laughs> I, I so brightly said, why Sicily would be like a football being kicked right off the toe of the boot of, <laughs> of Italy. So this was not the answer she was looking for. She said, I know where Sicily is. Why isn't it on this map? So when I explained, this is the map of the Italian pioneers, as it says, in Santa Barbara. This is where they're all from. She said, is there nobody from Sicily? or Calabria, and I said, yeah, there are a few names. Um, Sunseri was one, um, Aiello was another one, but they weren't household names to people who are still kind of new and contemporary to Santa Barbara. They wouldn't know those names. So I said, that's why they're not there, and these other people. Anyway, that just sort of set the stage of, <clears throat> when you're around Italians, be careful what you say, and you never know where you're stepping on a landmine. <laughs> and this was me right off in the beginning. So now we know to include Sicily, yay! <laughs> and then since then I've been able to add more names, so you can tell me afterwards if your family's from Sicily or Southern Italy, so give me their name. But in general, the interesting part is that Southern Italy was really the, where you got the great immigration and it came to the East Coast. And in California, of course you know the Italian Swiss colony up in San Francisco, and those people were Northern Italians. But in Santa Barbara, as you can see, it was really the very top of the boot, Let's see if I can get my little pointer there. This really the cuff and further north from Genoa and then over points west up to Como and then over to Veneto and Venice. So that's very unusual even compared to San Francisco. We really have a, quite a concentration up there. So let's take a look at those five areas and um, what, was, what they've all done here. The very first thing, of course, now that we're into it, is who was the first Italian? and a first Italian of a name that we would still know today. And I have Francisco Cavalieri, 1838, before even the American period. Do we have any of those relatives in town here or in an audience here? Speak now. But the one that you would probably know is, let's see, where do we go here, is the Craviota family. 
Craviotos left Italy, Mr. Cravioto, Antonio, left 1858, went by way of Mexico, and was in Hayward for about six or seven years, and came to Santa Barbara around 1867. And he had two sons, I'm sorry, he had a son and a daughter, and that, that was Fred uh, E, and then Fred had two sons, Fred A and EJ. They worked in the Ariana uh, saddle shop, harness shop here, and you look at the first guy there on the left, and doesn't he look Italian? <laughs> like, what's the matter with your face? What are you looking at? In fact, all of them kind of look Italian until you get to the guy at the right. And he looks like an Irish man that lost the troop from Riverdance. <laughs> but they're going to let him there today anyway. So maybe he'll dance when they start playing music. So the, uh, they worked at the blacksmith shop. And then this is on East De La Guerra, about 22, 27. Right now, that would be in the middle of uh, Paseo Nuevo. And then EJ opened the blacksmith shop with his brother, Cravioto Brothers. Uh, then their sons, Danny and Charlie, and they just passed away in the last 10 years. What a lot of fun they were to interview. Oh my gosh. I just have to tell you one story as a researcher. When I was interviewing them, they had information. Charlie was just on a roll, and he said in six, 1906, Dad did this, then he did that, then he worked for Arianas and had the dates and the places. I said, great, and I, I can't write fast enough of everything he's saying. And then I had gone back to the library and I'm researching little things related to that, maybe looking up the address. And it turned out that what they said wasn't quite right. So I thought I'll go back and maybe there's an explanation. So I come back to Charlie and Danny and I said, you said that your dad, I'm just making this up, it was something like this. We're working at the Arianas in uh, blacksmith shop in 1906, but they didn't actually open till 1910. Is there an explanation or another place, you know, ready, ready myself for the great reveal? And Charlie's quiet a moment, and I'm ready for the big answer. He looks over at Danny and goes, how about that? Dad didn't work there in 1906. <laughs> so just, yeah, just when you think you've got the perfect answer, it's not quite there. So uh, here's the saddle shop. This is back in the, around the turn of the century. And also they opened, uh, the father opened with um, Mr. Beckham. They had, uh, I couldn't find the, the one with the sign, but it said Cravioto and Beckham, or Beckham and Cravioto, and you recognize this building on the corner of Garden and Canon Perdido. It was the tea house, and now it's a legal services. So that's an old building with the original storefront before the turn of the century. Isn't that fun? Just juicy. So they did open up the Cravioto, um, like I said, the, the iron job, um, iron works, but we'll get back to that later. The other family that came early, here we go, is Mr. Giovanni Parma. So we should recognize that name, Parma. Um, he was born in 1848, so just make a mental note, 1848, he's born. Um, he came to the U.S. in 67 and in Santa Barbara a couple years after that. And what he did was he bought land, uh, kept buying land. Oh, I should back up. When he was in Italy, he lost both his parents at a young age. And he had older brothers and sisters, and his, he worked on the farm that his sister-in-law would be in charge of him. And he so badly wanted to go to school and learn. Isn't that kind of a lost longing, the idea of wanting education? And he used to smuggle books out into the cornfield or whatever, and then she would discover, and he said she would mistreat him or beat him badly and send him to the barn without any supper. But he so wanted education and didn't get a chance to finish because he had to work with his, uh, his older brothers and his sister-in-law. So one brother came back from the gold mines with some money and wanted to go back to the US, and that's how Giovanni Parma made it to eventually to Santa Barbara. So he comes here and he starts buying land and farming and sells his produce, by the way, to the Craviota for his store. So kind of nice little round thing there. And he actually is, becomes quite, no, I can't say well to do, but he's making a good living on his farming. He had seven kids and in his farming, by the way, he introduced celery to Santa Barbara and was the first to produce, um, commercially produce olive oil. So he had an olive press 
and in parma park you'll see a big row a big area of those olive trees that was probably part of his original ranch or farm he married i think this is the next one katarina pendola at our lady of sorrows and bridget craviota was the bridesmaid so the close this with the family there and he had a store uh, mr parma had a store on state street 700 block and the family as was done there, would have been living behind the store with the storefront being the retail area. And of his seven kids, they went to be quite successful and very well educated and very professional. So it was really that dream of an immigrant coming to the United States, coming to America and fulfilling what he wanted for himself through his children. He had two of his uh, children were attorneys, Harold Parma, who died in the 1990s. I was trying to talk to him at that time. And here's a man who's, gosh, I think he was 94 or so. He was born, I think, 1906. So think about this. I'm talking to a man in the 1990s, and his father was born? 1848. Isn't that interesting? You just go, whoa, time warp there. And his daughter went to law school up at Berkeley and got her law degree and went into legal, uh, the librarian, um, law librarian, and became the dean of law librarians across the country. So she really set the standard here in California. And they just honored her recently. I mean, she's long gone, but just because she was so phenomenal. And he had another sons who were bankers and others that had the store, continued with the store. Oh, there's the wine press. I'm sorry, there's the olive oil press. And there is their famous Grand Central Market. I think that's around the 700 block State Street. And we still have that building today, by the way. And it was called the Parma Building. Now it's Abercrombie and Fitch. And I think as long as the city is making all these rules and regulations, we ought to have one of those provisions that says, if there's a cool old building with a family name on it, it has to stay on the building. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And one other thing special about the Parmas was about the time Mr. Parma came here, it wasn't too long after Jose Lobero came here. Jose Lobero, of course, who started the Lobero Theater, he was into Italian, he added on to the old schoolhouse and made that two-story, largest adobe building, I believe, in the California, state of California. But he came across um, bad times, so it's a whole other story, uh, but committed suicide. And because he was Catholic, he couldn't be buried at that time in the Catholic cemetery. So the Parmas bought the, bought the plot in the Santa Barbara Cemetery for the Liberos. So just kind of a sweet, neat thing of people back in those days. Alrighty, so that finishes our area of just what I call random Italians coming to Santa Barbara. We also have, of course, uh, Franceschi, Fenzi, but that's such a long story, I just, I'm scooting right past it because there's so because that's a name that's so well known and there's so many of these other parts. So now we get into the immigration part of our local Italians. And we're starting with the Riverola Canavesa, which when these people came over starting around the 1880s, late 1880s, and they tended to mostly to be farmers. It didn't mean that they couldn't do something else. That's just Usually, somebody came over here, they found a job as a farmer, they write back home, hey, life is good here, you got a job, I've got something for you here, and the friends would start coming over, brothers, cousins, next door neighbors. And so, who are these people? And here's some of the names that you would recognize. Uh, I can't read them from here, but uh, Dezzetti and Martino and uh, Giordano, Cavalletto, uh, quite a number of them. And they come out here to farm. One of the men that comes out here early on is our Giacomo Giordano. And here he comes to work on the farm. By the way, this is the Stowe House reunion, and I think this is the Cavalettos and a bunch of other Italians there. I think this guy is, uh, let me see if I get him with the pointer. Oh, there we go. I think this is a cavalier right here. That's, uh, if you're upstairs or you can't see the pointer, it's uh, on the right, second row up from the bottom, the man with the white hair and the white shirt. I believe that's a cavalier. There's probably tons of them in there, but that's just one that looks familiar to me. 
And what's nice to notice is the change of the buildings around town. So Giacomo Giordano, comes James Giordano as he's in the United States, comes here, and this is the corner of, this building is facing Cam Perdido, and the side on the right here is Chapala Street. So the two-story building is the Boso Hotel, and next door is the grocery store, and this is where Mr. Giordano first comes to Santa Barbara, and there's other Italians in the Boso Hotel, so they welcome, they take care of everybody, and so far, so good. So remember this, we're gonna come back to this. And he ends up being the foreman on the Moore Ranch, and um, boy, these look like characters, don't they? Okay, now Mr. Giordano is Now, if you can't see the pointer, he's in the front row. He has the white suspenders. He has the dark hat and dark mustache. But they just look like such characters. Uh, the guy in the bottom on the left, it looks like he's got a, like a, a plastic milk carton, but I've got to assume it's a white jug. So it looks like they've got some moonshine things going on there. But um, they were happy working on the Moore Farm. So, uh, And it's interesting, of course, because in that general area is where Giordano's is now. When you're going down um, Patterson towards the beach, it's kind of in the same area, so it's that throwback to our roots. And Mr. Giordano, by the way, has number, oops, yes, there we go. That's Mr. Giordano and his wife and their kids. I want to point out a couple of them. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Oops. Really sorry about that. There we go. All right, so it's Mr. Giordano on the left, the mother on the right holding baby Frank, uh, the daughter up at the top. At the very top on the right is Peter Giordano. Now, don't go up to Mr. Giordano that you know today and say, oh, I saw your picture. <laughs> that is another Peter Giordano. That would be, <laughs> that would be his uncle. So Peter's father is the baby here, so that's Frank. Okay, and these, these are the twins, and this is just a random kid. <laughs> and no, I'm not joking. So what would happen is, if a family, maybe something happens to the parents, or maybe the father died and the mother's very sick, or vice versa, you would just, in the Italian community, everybody just took care of everybody. So they would take the kid in, and we don't know the story, we haven't found anything about that, so yes, that was a random extra kid. <laughs> okay, so, the story here is that Peter, the oldest, gets the, they worked for the local grocery store called Corn, Cornwalls. And after a while, he went to business school and he decided that the boys ought to go into business for themselves and open a grocery store, which they do in March of 1915. They start on State Street uh, as their first store around 600 block. Then they move another store up around where the copper coffee pot, or Aldo's used to be. I guess it's Aldo's again. And that was another store that was their, um, it's very interesting to follow the grocery store business because you think you're just selling groceries and you don't realize that there's changes in how people shop. So when they opened their store, you would come in and there would be a clerk that would follow you around and you would say, I want those two peaches, not that one, that one, and this, that. They would collect all of that, they'd put it in a basket, you'd sign off on it, they would deliver it later to your home and you'd get a bill at the end of the month. So the Giordano's thought, we'll do another store called, you know, uh, I forgot the name, you know, Shop and Walk Out. That's not the name of it, but it was something. So Cash and Carry, thank you. Whoever <laughs> just gave me that tip, Cash and Carry. And it did not catch on when they opened, 1919. But later on, of course, that will become the fashion, but they were just a little ahead of their time. What else have we got here? Okay, so this store, is they're facing you, and you are in the middle of Cam and Perdido. And remember when I talked about the Bosa Hotel and next door, the little grocery store? This is precisely in that location. So over on the right, if you were to turn around the corner, you'd be going down Chapala Street. So this is around 1923 when they opened this. This was their first supermarket, and this was store number one. And what was unusual about this, and the reason I bring this up, is that any business of note would be on State Street. It was unheard of to go off State Street unless you just had some kind of bungly little building or a business. 
but they went off State Street and a whole block over to Chapala, and people went, oh, boys are kind of crazy, but they're young, you know, let, it, let them give it a try, and it was quite a success. And you notice it must be the 4th of July, so folks, how many stars are on the flag? Okay, just checking. And just to go back, that's where the store was. We see the building on the right there. Left is the Bosno Hotel that was there in the 1880s when Giacomo Giordano first came here. And when they were building Nordstrom's, that Bosno Hotel was still there. Oops, there we go. And what happened is the city sold it for a dollar and the people moved it over to Caddy Corner to the uh, courthouse where it's now folk mode music. Oops, oops, I'll take this back. When the boys opened up their store, this is what it looked like. It's next to the Boso Hotel. The Boso Hotel, over time, becomes their liquor store, and then becomes, you know, actually they extended over here and became part of this store, so these were both Giordano things. This building later on became, way later in the 60s, a mattress store or something. This store, the Boso Hotel, that was later the wine shop, stays there, and now we'll see, there we go. So if you read all about this, and by the way, we did have a wonderful book, oh, there we go, Remembering Giordano's, uh, this was a commission by Peter Giordano, and I have to tell you how much fun this was, because every Italian in town at one point worked for the Giordano's, and he gave me free reign just to do whatever, he didn't even check up on saying, you know, I, I kept saying, do you want to read what I wrote? He goes, nope, it's your book. So I said, but what if people have these interesting stories? He says, it'll add flavor. So it was fun because all these people who grew up here had worked at some time with Giordano's and they had great stories about the bosses and they were all Italians or they were related somehow. So John Sr. used to say, now don't tell anybody that you're relative. Don't tell anybody that you're related to us when he hired like the Paioli girls or any of the, the old Italian families back then. Okay, next we come to La Notte Fazzolo. And I think of this as the merchants. Again, it's not that somebody from there wasn't a stonemason or a farmer. It's just when I think of all these great merchants, I'm thinking Lenati Pozzolo, or so, oh, so often, that's where they came from. So there's a bunch of the names that you would recognize. I'll let that sink in a little bit. So this is, a, of course, the people that started me on this whole travel was the Marathis. And uh, in Italy, I heard it over there, you're correct. In Italy, the name is Maratta. But you know how people come across through Ellis Island, things get changed, or just Santa Barbara that you know messes up the pronunciation of, uh, like Isla Vista should be Isla Vista, et cetera. <laughs> the things that we can't pronounce. So when it came to Maratta, it just became Marathi. And Giordano, by the way, was spelled G-I-O-R, the Italian way, until Peter, that's Peter the Elder, don't get confused here, and when he was in school in Goleta back at the turn of the century, and the teacher asked him how to spell his name, but he doesn't know any English quite yet, so the teacher decided to fill it in for him with a J, and that's why Giordano is unique in Santa Barbara, and Marathi is unique to Santa Barbara. Go, Santa Barbara. Alrighty, so there were, the Marathis came here around 18, as early as 1877, one of them, and the both of them then started coming through the rest of the, nine, I'm sorry, 1880s. And just to kind of cut to the chase of all the different, oh, first of all, before I cut to the chase, this is the Nati Pozzolo in Italy. Doesn't that look like Santa Barbara? Yes. So when people say, what got them here to Santa Barbara? I mean, Los Angeles, New York, we understand, but Santa Barbara's so small. Somebody would hear about it, and then they'd come here and fall in love. It looks so much like their hometown, and then they would send back for the rest. So that's why you get the flood of people from a tiny town. But the look of it so much, and this was a perfect example. And these merchants of the Marathis, there's so many things that they opened. Luigi opened Olympia House. Anybody remember that or have heard of it? That was around the 500 block of Anna Kappa Street. And that was a boarding house for men and naturally you would be picking up on a lot of the Italians that come here, they're going to find out where can, an, you know, where are the Italians, they are, or maybe they already know when they're coming over here to say Olympia House and someone will get them there. Because
because Santa Barbara was a very small town there, of course. It didn't really extend much past Constance Avenue, Constance Street. And we have, okay, so there we have the Olympia. We also had the Castle Rock Restaurant at State and Haley. Sterling Drug, there was a lot of the drug stores owned by the Maradis. Anybody remember Marathi Drug? Yeah, okay. Columbia Drug. Uh, uh, Ambrose Marathi, he had a place, um, he moved around from 598, I'm uh, sorry, the, the, six, the six, 500 block of State Street, up and down, they kept moving up and down the block, opening this one, and then two days later, two weeks later, to open up one here. So they're in the same block, but you know, Marathi's owns the block almost because they've got the businesses going there. And Frank Marathi had the Barber Hotel, which now we know is the Hotel Santa Barbara. Uh, he was the manager there, and the other famous one is, oh, say, Louis Marathi had the El Camino Pharmacy, the Imperial on State Street, Charles Marathi had Top Hat. Who remembers Top Hat, or maybe from your parents? That was on East Carrillo. Ed Marathi Liquors. And here's a very famous one. Anybody remember eating there as a kid? Yeah, so this is a very, very famous, well-known, you know, kind of like Joe's and Harry's today. Everybody in town goes to Tony's Log Cabin. So between the restaurants and the hotels and the liquor stores, Marathi's basically supplied everything for you to eat, drink, and be merry. And then, of course, for something to handle the headache or the hangover or the indigestion, that's when you go to all the Marathi pharmacies. So this way, just the Italian alone, just the Marathi family had you covered. <laughs> but there were other stores, and I'll just give a sampling here. I was trying to find the, I, I think we didn't load the ones with the Italian bakery, which is, of course, really well known. Um, here we have Luigi Monzo had the store on, uh, what is that, Cota and Chapala Street, and sold a suspicious amount of grapes <laughs> during the Prohibition. <laughs> another one, another landmark. Oh, there we have Mr. Monzo, there we go. Doesn't he look like he's got grapes behind the counter? No, he could have grapes in front of the counter, that was okay. Okay, yes, now we have the Nardi Hotel. And this is the one that's catty corner to City Hall on Anacapa and De La Guerra. I'm trying to think of what's there now. It was John Douglas for a while. We all pass it every single day. <laughs> we can't think of what's in there. So it's across from the, the El Paseo on one side. The other one is uh, a catty corner to the City Hall. And. Um, the man who opened this, Mr. Francisco Nardi, and he opened this hotel there, named for where he came from. It was the Maca, um, I'm gonna say this wrong, Monte Catina Hotel, but mostly everybody called it the Nardi Hotel. And when the new Italians showed up in town, and this is around at, coming into the turn of the century, they would just say Nardi, Monte Catina, and everybody would know to send them up the street to stay at this hotel. And, Let's see what we've got here. Oh, and the other one is the Mashanti family, also from this area. And the Mashantis had a bakery on the corner of Ortega and Anacapa. And you see here is Mr. Mashanti. There. Mr. Mashanti, there's David Mashanti, his son, and Martin D. Fiasi, Fiasi, sorry who lived right around the corner. So we know that the, the Piazzi, the motor, et cetera, et cetera, that's all the same family there. And the bakery was on the right, and the stuff that they made was all the traditional uh, Italian breads that you might consider, but also the specialty things that people were looking for at Christmas time. So in the estates in Montecito, many of the people who worked in the Montecito estates as perhaps chauffeurs or on the grounds, um, the owners of the estates would ask these Italians to go into town to Mashanti Bakery where they could get all the specialty breads during the Christmas time. So the bread, the bakery was on, the, the, the bakery oven actually was on the back side of this building. This is across the street from Cravioto, so you kind of got the record there. And on the left side of this building was where the house was. Now later on we notice, I think this is what we have here, yes, that it's the Paradise Cafe. And there's Cravioto, now, now this is all down, but this was the Cravioto's with their ironworks forever and ever. 
So here is where the bakery is, and over here is the house. So uh, if you're upstairs, the house is to the left of the, uh, as you see, the building there. And actually, in the Mashanti family, they had uh, a daughter who, who died, six years old, was actually murdered. And I, I only mention this not to be terrifying, but it was the custom back then that when you lost a child, very often when you had another child of the same sex, you would give that child the same name, which seems kind of horrible to us now, but it was like this one replaces and now you know she's come back. And so they did have another daughter around 1917, and her name was also Renata. And some of you would know her as Renata Nichols, and she just passed away a half a year ago at 100 years old. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman. Her cousins were the Di Piazzi's around the corner, and some of you old timers, long timers might remember, one of the Piazzi's was Martin, and the other one was his sister, Teresa. And you would know her as Teresa Jansons or Teresa Lane, and she was in the Native Daughters, and she's the one that would chore, she studied under another lady, Maria de Los Angeles Reese, to learn the old Spanish dances, and she herself um, then taught the next generation of the um, native daughters of the Golden West. And she was the one who invented the shawl dance that you used to see at the courthouse. I know which one, you know, remember they came out and did that and it was to the tune, put your little foot right in. Anyway, there we have it for Teresa. Alrighty, going on we have Como, the, sta the stonemasons, and some of the other builders. Uh, let's see what we start off with here. Okay, there's a bunch of names. I think we have Mr. Perry represented well in the audience today, correct? And I thought for a long time in the beginning, in my youth, when I was doing this, I thought all the stonemasons came from Lake Como, and that's how they got here and they built the walls. And again, I had it backwards. Somebody came over here, got a job as a stonemason, or was trained, then called his friends over and said, come on over here. So they were not stonemasons necessarily back in Lake Como, back in Italy. Just once they got here, they got into the trade. Before we get right into the stonemasons, we'll start with, oh yes, we, were going to, we are gonna start with the stonemasons. Um, I wanna give you an example of the stone walls that we see in Santa Barbara. Now this one's not stone, this is adobe. This is coming down from the mission because you'll see every kind of stonework following this route. You're going down Los Olivos. This is an adobe wall built in probably the 1950s, so later day. It was to keep the cows at the mission so they wouldn't wander all over the neighborhood. And it is in a style called coarsed ashlar. And if you just think of brick, and you put it in layers, and each brick is the same size, it's the same height. So that style is called coarsed ashlar. So it's ashlar is the layer, and it's coarse, meaning it's going along the course, and it's all the same height. All righty. Now we're coming down to the corner of the garden and Los Olivos, and we're in front of Sierra Hall, and we see kind of more of the same, but these are bigger stones and they're cut stones with a mortar hanging out in front. You can see the exterior mortar. And now you're coming to the cemetery, sorry, seminary, St. Anthony's, and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work there. If you look carefully at those stones, you see that they're all different sizes and heights. And so that's called random ashlar. So it's a different way to fit it all together. But beautiful work because it's like putting a puzzle together, right? So you've got a small piece and you've got to get another piece just like that to fit in. So the masons are the ones building the wall, the stone cutters are the ones that are then shaping that stone before the masons put it together. And then you have the quarry men who are actually gonna pull that big thing out of the ground and break it down. And then continuing up here, we see that this looks like uh, random ashlar, at least from this side of the screen. And that's just a mess. <laughs> so that's just a cement wall with kind of fake, you know, veneer on there just so we know what we're bearing. And more cut rock. This was probably done in the 19th century. Um, interesting, the style kind of changed in the, most of the, the Upper East in general, I would say that that was under the British Isle stonework. And then when it gets into the random ashlar, that's when I think we're getting into the Italian period. The Italians coming 
um, from Lake Como around starting after the turn of the century, right at and then after the turn of the century through the teens. And this, the people before us, La Nate Pozzolo, coming around the 18, late 1880s into the um, 1890s. Okay, just cruising around here, there's the green doors. Again, we're at, right at Garden Street going into Constance, just to give you some more samples. Here you have rubble, just the stone, round stone just put together and piles, and it's kind of a, almost looks like that's kind of quartz, actual rubble stone, not shaped. And here's the Dreyfus Estate, that's that big building right one year at the corner of Constance and Garden. And I just want to point this out because look at the absolutely beautiful, beautiful work, internal mortar, and just gorgeous. And more of this going down on Constance as you're heading towards State Street. You notice how fantastic this is. There's a capstone on the top, meaning it kind of overhangs. But look the beautiful work and how finished it is on the bottom here. Uh, you can look in at the first layer off the sidewalk. But you notice the layer in between, instead of making the stones the same and just parallel, they're making it parallel to, you know, to the uh, plumb going down this way, level, rather than just shifting the stone and making the same size. So quite a lot of clever work. Anyway, now we continue more with Gorst Ashlar, and now we get to the corner of State and Constance, and after about 1950s, this is when more of the work is done by Mexicans in Santa Barbara, but so many of them studied in Italy. This is a round stone or a five-sided sided stone that was shaped and put there. I'm just giving you some background here. This, all this wall I saw when they were building this, they pulled this gigantic rock that was the size of a Volkswagen van um, from the property at the First Presbyterian Church, you know, where they added on that kind of community hall. So before they added that, when they were gonna do that, that's when they dug out that big, huge rock, broke it down, dressed it, you know, shaped it, and there we've got it. So the reason I bring this up is now that you start looking at this, when you go through our town in Santa Barbara, you realize the miles and miles of spectacular cut stone that was done. So, yes, I know there was the British Isles there in the, in the 19th century, but over the course of the 20th century, especially how many of this is done by these Italians and just what a cool city that we have with just little curves and little touches all over the place with this beautiful, just, just for the beauty of it. And can't leave without talking about our Nolis, the stone. And, you know, Santa Barbara, we just love our old landmarks. So the Anolis, once they went out of the business, you know, the Italians in town saying, we can't do this. And so God bless Dave Perry and his friends who said, no, we're going to keep this thing going. And Arnolis is still a landmark today. Thank you very much. And some of the other stonework there, we've got the one down on the, the, uh, the old... The old fish market now is down the corner of Garden and Cabrillo Boulevard, and it's the, uh, the travel center, I'm sorry, the visitor center. And the last one is this house on Padre Street. And you notice in the stonemasons there was, not that he was from Como, was um, Ozzie de Ross, and Ozzie de Ross's father actually, and he actually worked on um, this one, and the walls around Marymount School. So it's kind of nice, because here's a guy that comes over from Italy with just nothing, nothing, works on this beautiful estate. And in this case, I'm referring to Ozzie de Ross's father, Antonio de Ross. So he's just a poor laborer. And just how things can turn around for you when you have the, the gumption and the will and the work and put it all in there. And then so many decades after that, his granddaughters attended the private school, Marymount, which was the originally the black estate that he had built the walls on. And what have we got next? More builders. So I want to highlight here that we've got Pendola, who just about paved everything in town. <laughs> and here is a man named Alex Delfonso. He's in front of a map of the city of Santa Barbara. You might notice up kind of in the upper leftish corner, you might recognize Garden Street going around Constance as it curves there. The little black dots that you see are the buildings, houses that he built all over Santa Barbara, over 200 and something. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that map. I think it might have been lost in one of the grandkids' homes during the fire. Um, so what the reason I bring him up was not just that the Italians built so much. Those names that I showed you weren't just builders. I know Reginato was a skip loader and he was telling me all the different areas that he did. I'm like, oh, you did Hidden Valley, you did 
right where my house is. So every place that you're thinking of, there's a little mark of an Italian someplace, either underneath the soil, stamped in the cement. They built the house. Um, but D'Alfonso is interesting because, again, he comes uh, early on from Italy. He was a young man. Uh, he made himself out to be, I think, 13 when he came over, even though he was 16 or 16 rather than 18. I thought only women did that. Uh, but apparently it was because he was um, didn't want to look of age because he had to have a job to come into the United States. He didn't have a job. He had an uncle speak for him, but he just didn't have any work for him. So he gets here, makes his way to Santa Barbara. Long story short, he goes into developing buildings. He didn't have a background in architecture. He just had such incredible good taste and common sense. And one of the most interesting things that he did was a tract called the Diana Lane Tract. This is off of Milpas, look this up, find it, go there. You'll notice going to the street on either side, you'll see a little uh, stone pillar, right? Marking that, and it's actually U-shaped. And when he built these homes, they were actually the city's first green building. And he recycled material, starting with the armory on Milpas Street, and the old Lockheed place that they had there, Brown Canna Perdido and Milpas, and he would take the two by 12 boards, split those into two by fours and build from there. He also took the wiring out of that building and rewired into these homes, but they were still so solidly built that even today when you're looking for one of those homes that's being sold on Diana Lane, you will see in the real estate little bit, it'll say, D'Alfonso built home. And let's see what else he's got. Uh, just some more pictures here. Oh, but we're going back to the Graviota brothers who are doing the ironworks and the beautiful stuff that they did because they did the ironwork on these little houses. Now, one of the fun things is in this neighborhood, he didn't go through and just level it all out and then build houses. He let each house stay in its kind of environment. If there was a tree there, the tree was left there, a rock was left there. He just built around it. He didn't have one blueprint and then stick it down there. So each house would have its own vantage point and its own orientation. So we wouldn't just have one after another and you open up your kitchen curtain and look right into somebody's bedroom. So really beautiful. And that each one had these little touches. So again, the ironwork there. And uh, more on the Craviotos. I'm just jumping over here to Lotus Land that they did the gates on that. So in their ironworks, they started first doing springs for the carriages and then went into doing patches for things like during the war for the refrigerators and things that they would do uh, that work. But the decorative artwork was, uh, decorative ironwork was what we really know them for. And also their barbecues. Does anybody remember those Graviota built one of a kind, totally cool collector's item if you could find one. These gigantic, wonderful, portable type, I mean, they're heavy, but you could move them. They're not built in. And when you're doing all this building, someone needs to clean it up. So this takes us to the Borgatello family. <laughs> um, this is just great. So they came out here. Charlie was born in Italy, and they came out and had their other kids here. So we've got, uh, OK, you see Charlie up at the top, the oldest kid. Oop, there we go. Uh, top on the left, if you're upstairs trying to watch there. And the girls from left to right, it looks like that's uh, that, that's Laura, baby Ida, what a face, Ida, you can't miss that one, and then uh, Augusta on the, on the right. And after this, they had their baby Mario Sr. came after this. So a little bit on this family, uh, they, have, they, they came out here because the mother's brother was a chauffeur for one of the families in Montecito, and that's how they found out about it. They come over here, and around the 1917, 18, 19, we had the Spanish influenza. Mrs. Borgatello got the influenza. She went to uh, St. Francis Hospital. It was in October. She recovered. The father came home about a week before Christmas, and he had a headache, kind of a sore throat. And it got worse over the night, and within three days, he was dead. She's a widow now. She has five children. The oldest is barely 12 years old. She, they lived on Coda Lane off of East Valley in Montecito. She took in boarders, which was very common at the time, Italian boarders, and then of course, you know, you cook them a breakfast before they go out to work, and they had chickens. 
and she would send Charlie around the neighborhood to collect people's wet garbage. Wet garbage, what an idea. So long before we separated our garbage now and we thought we were so advanced, people did that you know, 80, 90 years ago. So they would, co you know, he'd bring home scraps for the chickens, and over time, people would say, hey, Charlie, I'll give you a quarter if you take this as well. So he starts collecting a little more, a little bit more. And as time goes on, just to make the long story short, uh, he goes, gets himself a Model T truck or Model A truck, uh, starts picking up things, and we didn't have garbage collecting back then. It was transfer company. You collected it and you dumped it someplace else, but there were different people doing that. And so many of them were Italian. So the Tavernas and the Leonellos, and who else have I got in there? But the Borgatello started in there, and the, the, the youngest brother joined his oldest brother, and they went into business with a, just a, a happy go going after it. And they ended up buying out the other people. And you know, they were just such a class act. You've ever seen, even today, the Borgatello trucks, how clean they are for a garbage truck? The silver is gleaming. Have you ever noticed that? I guess somebody scrubs them down when they come home. Yay, only in Santa Barbara do we have these sparkling garbage trucks. <laughs> so yes, applause for the, for the clean garbage trucks. <laughs> Just love it, and they're so friendly. Every time they stop in front of the house, the guy's talking to me, saying hi, yes, you know, oh, can I throw this in? I'm running in with the garbage still that I hadn't gotten to the outside bag. Come on down, they'll wait. So, so good stuff. Um, so anyway, that's how they became quite the success in Santa Barbara, but just, Immigrant families starting, just using their brains and their willpower and going after it. And what do we have next? Okay, Genoa Riva Trigosa, the fisherman. And we start with, let's see, who we got here? And this is in not just one area, it's that kind of that, the large area within that, not just Genoa, but just in that whole area. And our story actually starts with the first big fisherman family, and they were 19th century, and that was the Larcos. They had um, 11 children, actually I think there were two brothers, 11 children, seven children, a fleet of 12 boats. Oh, there's Sebastian Larco, I and mean, he, he himself was a landmark, quite remarkable. Uh, the father of the Santa Barbara fishing fleet had a monopoly since the 19th century. Um, let's see what we've got here. Doesn't he look Italian? <laughs> and a shark. <laughs> so we have had sharks out here for some while. So I just want to just kind of cut to the chase on this one, which is how good these fishermen were. This was a big family. This is the 19th century. Now I realize maybe the ocean's got different changes of the fish, but check this out. Santa Barbara Daily in, uh, News, uh, April 28, 1885. Marco's son, in two hours yesterday, caught 150 barracudas, five yellowtails, and one monstrous sea bass. So that might have been a fluke, but a month later, the newspaper reports, maybe there wasn't a whole lot of news going on, and they're reporting on the fishermen. Sebastian Larco, when he was a boy, son of Andrea Larco, caught a sea, black sea bass weighing over 300 pounds. Ooh about pulling that puppy up. And before you just think that's the end of it, two days, I'm sorry, two years later, another Larco boy, another kid, two years later, sea bass are very plentiful in the harbor. The Larco boy caught 100 of them inside 30 minutes last evening. The shark and the swordfish at that time were considered worthless. Interesting, so that's not, not so cool. Let's see what else we've got here. And here's some of our fishing boats, 19th century coming in, just a little bits there. But now we get to a little bit more fun, and that's the Castagnolas. Giovanni Battista came here to Santa Barbara from that area. He had nine sons, and his brother Salvatore had 11. So 20 kids between them. That's a lot of little Castagnolas running around. <laughs> um, a lot of us know the very public figure, George V. Castagnola. And during the Depression, he was gonna work as an electrician, and he was laid off. And so he thought he could work uh, going into fishing, and he goes with his younger brother, also named Mario, there was a pattern there, but also his brother Lino. They go together, and they, and Battisto, and they get themselves a tugboat, and so far so good, until they decided to undercut the Larco Empire. 
So here in this tiny little town, you have the feuding fishermen from, from Italy. <laughs> and Chico, who was a Larco, was always trying to undercut George. But George was just such a character. I know a lot of you in here knew him, but just, just all the things that I'm reading about him, he was just a good sense of humor, and he was a good businessman, and he just went after it. So remember that you've got this thing where the guys are going out every day. There's other fishermen. They're not fishermen. I'm sorry, they're not Italian, but they're also fishing. But the Larcos and the Castagnolas, besides fishing themselves, they're working as brokers. So everybody's going to sell to them, and then they're going to take and sell to the markets or the restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're always trying to undercut each other, get more money, whatever this is. So George pretends he's one of the Slavic fishermen in the area. I guess there was some Slavic fishermen. And he calls up, um, uh, who did he call? One of the Larcos, and he poses as being Martin, Martin. And he says, uh, how much you pay for my fish? Larco says, eight cents a pound, or eight cents a piece, whatever it was. So armed with that, George knows what to do, and now he's gonna give everybody 10 cents. So when you're bidding, you're not next to each other, you're just kind of running around, but you know, this, if you know that he's gonna pay you 10 cents, you're gonna go to him. Mr. Castagnola also had his house up on the Riviera, where his wife, Ren uh, Renee, is that correct? Renata? So she's up at the house, and she can see at the end of the day, once you know the fishing kind of runs out in their circles, and the fishing boats start coming back in, she calls George's office down by the, <laughs> down by the Cabrillo Boulevard to say the boats are coming in, so he could always beat Larco at the wharf when they're all coming in. And Larco's always trying to figure out when they're coming in, see something, runs over to the wharf, there's George wheeling and dealing with everybody, getting the fresh, fresh fish. And at one point, Larco decides he's gonna undercut George altogether, and he goes to the restaurants and the stores, and actually to the good hotels, and he says, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give you for the next week, month, whatever it was, free fish, free fish. And I guess the hotels were smart enough to go, mm, I smell a stinky fish, because they knew once that George was run out of business, the other guy would have the monopoly and that'd be the end of that. And right now they're having a pretty good deal when the two of them are bidding back and forth. So one other thing that the, uh, the um, Castagnolas did was during World War II, when there's a shortage on vitamins to be sent out to the military, and that shark liver was a source of vitamin A, and that's when they started fishing for shark. Um, also for the swordfish, which then people started eating. It wasn't popular before then, but because of rationing meats, we go into that. And here's some more of these. I think these are of the Castagnolas, some of the other guys. Oops. There we have their seafood down on Cabrillo Boulevard. And I love this. Men sort of at work. There's George. <laughs> I don't know if they got any work done that day. And there's the lobster pot. Who remembers the lobster pot? And they started the Pescatore Club, the Fisherman's Club in 1945. Okay, last but not least, we have Crespano de Grappa, the dairyman. And Crespano de Grappa is about the size of a hole in the wall. And I can't tell you how many families came from there. Um, <laughs> including Melchiori. Remember good old Ugo Melchiori? And he had an accent so wide you could drive a truck through it. He was so adorable and he was so proud of everything I was writing about the Italians. He kept calling me up with new information. I have a list, I have a list of 60 names, 60 names from Crispano de Grappa. So I asked him if there are 60 names here in Santa Barbara, who's left in Italy? And I mean, cause it's a really, really small village practically. And he said, there's actually more people from Crespano in Australia. <laughs> That's the first place that they went to. I went, there's, okay. So the, apparently they do have some people back in the old country. Again, I thought all the dairy men came from Crespano, but they were men from Crespano who came here and became dairy men. And there were people from other areas. I think, in fact, to pick on, on uh, Perry from Como, I think he was in dairy for a while. So they, they did trade off, but the great interesting thing was that our big industry in Santa Barbara was dairy, and it was run almost entirely by Italian immigrants. So I have a great quote here. This was from about 
half a century or plus ago, and it said, world travelers say that American milk is the best produced anywhere. California milk is, by official test, the best in America, meaning through all the different tests and awards that they would win. And Santa Barbara County milk, according to state records, excels everything in California. And everything in Santa Barbara was these Italians. I know there was a few Gentiles there, but basically it was all Italians. <laughs> and you got a sampling of some of those names there. Uh, in 1923, it was reported that there were 28 dairies and 3,000 cows to supply Santa Barbara with milk. Uh, between 1936 and 1939, just three years, Santa Barbara dairy, Italian dairymen had won more than 60 statewide medals. And you go through year by year and you see Santa Barbara just hogging all the gold medals. Uh, it was just quite astonishing. By 1940, the local paper was reporting that dairy was the largest industry in Santa Barbara County. Dairy. Nobody told us this before. The single biggest in dis, uh, industry in the district with more than a million dollars going in and out every year. And it was the first city in the United States to require one of the DACRO caps, which are those little metal things that keep it on, the wire thing. And apparently the theory was, or the story was, that in the foothills along here, that at nighttime, the temperature would drop to freezing. And so there in your little glass milk with the little cap, all the cream goes to the top and would push the cap off. And then all the wildlife around the Riviera, et cetera, et cetera, would come over and lick it, it would be unsanitary. And so that's how we started it here. And then it, you would think that somebody in a colder climate would get it, but maybe they didn't have enough wild things coming along and licking it. And maybe that's the inspiration. Okay, there's an example of a dairyman with nine kids, if you actually can see them all there. <laughs> I think this one was off with Milpas. And one of the big ones was the Live Oak Dairy, Montecito. One of the best known dairies. I hear a lot of people you're recognizing out there. And it would seem that most of the important Italian dairymen were at one time or another connected with the Live Oak. It was 82 acres, one of the largest parcels in Montecito. And it's the upper end of San Ysidro, uh, past East Valley Road, and Vincento Penza was one of the ones who started it, 1903. So our dairymen came here as early as 1903, but most of them were coming around the late teens into the 20s, and even up until late into the 40s, some of them coming after um, World War II. But in general, most of them coming around 1920-ish on either direction. Live Oak itself won 47 gold medals. That's a lot. In California, three silver, et cetera, et cetera. Later on, they combined with the Riviera Dairy. They've got their milk. And we even have the butter, sorry, they got the butter and we've got the milk. Yeah. And I'd say the Duke of the Dairymen would be Anthony Prevedello. This guy was just a mover, shaker. Oh, we got relatives out there. <laughs> um, he's associated with the two biggest dairies, which was the Riviera and, uh, as I mentioned, the Live Oak Dairy. And both of his daughters married into dairy families. Uh, Peggy uh, pa uh, married Attilio Panazon, and he was his partner in the Riviera. And then Pauline married Paul Ripperetti, Dr. Ripperetti, and his family had dairies, et cetera. A uh, little funny thing was I talked to Attilio. Uh, thankfully, I talked to a lot of these people before they passed on. They had great stories. So Attilio Panazon comes from Italy. He's born, actually, in Germany. His father was a stonemason, had been doing work in Germany. He was born there. So when it's time for Attilio to come to the United States, he wants to emigrate here to come in, and there was a quota. They used to have quotas on different countries. Italy was filled. So he was refused, went back, grabbed his German identity, <laughs> came in on a German passport. That's how they came to Santa Barbara. He came to Santa Barbara. Also, Prevedello's brother-in-law was Tony Cavalli. We got any Cavallis out there who owned the Foothill Dairy? And his sister-in-law was married to John Vendrasco. So there's all kinds of little dairymen all the way connected all over the place, sort of incestuously, but you know, happily and legally so. There's the Riviera Dairy. And how many of you remember when you came into Santa Barbara from the north, this is what you would see for you newcomers, meaning you've been here 30 years or less. Uh, this is where Sears Roebuck Automotive is, basically. 
Now, when I bring this up to your attention, also because when they built this dairy, it was D'Alfonso. Remember, we talked about how clever he was. He designed the dairy and made it flyless. And by that, I mean not that there weren't any flies in there, but flies tend to come in where there's dead air. And what he did was he built the doors that would go clear up to the ceiling. There wouldn't be that little lip so that the flies wouldn't congregate around there. And people would come, dairymen would come up from Los Angeles to visit this flyless dairy that Mr. Delfonso had built for the Riviera Dairy up here. Oh, wait, I'll just kind of skip on some of these things. There's a, the Live Oak Dairy truck, I believe, downtown. And this is uh, Bob Zanesco, Bob Zanesco, and they were, their dairy was at uh, Sycamore, so they were all over the place. Interestingly, one other thing is a new uh, dairy chief came in from, I think, Minnesota. Uh, his name was Erickson, and he came in and made the rule that the local cows, if they were tuberculin, if they had TB, they couldn't be used for milk. They were thinking, of course, but people at that time thought, well, it's gonna go through pasteurization, so not a problem. But he wouldn't allow it, and they had to slaughter those cattle. So this was a real hardship for a lot of them, and Zanesco actually told me this story himself, where his father had just about killed him to have to slaughter all these sort of, you know, the, the cow, cattle weren't gonna die from the TV, I guess they just carried it. But nonetheless, it wiped out many of those cattle herds, the dairy herds, and it was a very sad point. But just to go back to finish this area, Santa Barbara's um, mark in the dairy field was Santa Barbara was the first city to, not only to do the thing about the TB free cow, so that was another thing they did, and the little daffodil caps, the first city in the nation mandating boilers to provide hot water to clean and sterilize the milk equipment. So this doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but that was a big deal at that time. Santa Barbara started that first, then it went to the state and carried on, et cetera, et cetera. And to be processed with a certified hood, the bottles, and that's enough, okay. So, how many, how many Italians did we actually have in Santa Barbara to finish up? We had so many Italians that Italian really was the third language here. And this is starting, I'd say, about after the turn of the century, where now we've got Riverola Canavesa in, we've got Lenate Gozzolo, Lunde Como's now here, we're coming in now with the last area, the, the, um, the Genovese, the fishermen were kind of coming in a steady stream. They didn't come in a block like the other country, like the other cities did. You know about the Bank of America, started by A.P. Giannini, it was originally the Bank of Italy, but before that, it was Bank, there was the Banco Popolare Fugazi, which was the first bank for Italians up in the Italian Swiss colony in San Francisco. And Giannini's father-in-law sat on that, and when he passed, then Giannini got the seat, and he thought, you're not doing enough for these Italian immigrants, that these microloans, oh, wait, before this became popular, microloans, the Italians were doing it for themselves back a century ago saying these guys just need $1,000, they can start their business, they'll pay it back, they don't need a huge amount, they just need a little get, get them you know, off, their, off the sidewalk. So when that started, this was around 1906, 1908, right around then when they started the, the Banco Popolare Fugazi, there were so many Italians up there, that that's where it started, also Richmond, San Jose, Fourth Bank, Santa Barbara. And later on, when the, he opened his Bank of Italy, they also had the Bank of Italy in Santa Barbara. And I can't see from here, is this Fugazi? Yeah, yeah okay. And I think that's the Bank of Italy, unless you can read it and it says something different. That's Fugazi, okay. So this is, we're talking very early on in the century that Santa Barbara had its own Italian banks, quite astonishing. And that might be the bank, that's the Balboa building, I believe. And is that the Bank of Italy downstairs? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I can't see it from this angle. All right, so um, one other thing is that there were so many Italians here that we had about starting in 1928, our own vice council. So instead of having to travel to San Francisco or LA, wherever the council was at that time, we had someone here to process that, um, cards, visas, and specialty things in Santa Barbara. 
And the last one we had, actually Mr. G, um, Jim DiLoretto was our counsel at one point. He just passed away about two years ago, I believe. And the last uh, Italian counsel we had was Pier Guarini Sr. And he passed away in 1988, I believe. And I don't think we've had one since then, but for 60, 70 years in this town, we had our own vice counsel. Quite extraordinary. So to kind of finish up here, oh, um, here's a monograph we did. <laughs> um, actually, this is, this is also available. I have uh, just a couple of those. I have a number of these, but um, they'll need to sell afterwards. The Santa Barbara Historical Society um, Museum published two monographs that I did on the Italians, and it had several um, exhibits based on the Italian history. And what I think is interesting is it would be easy and kind of cheesy for me to go, okay, next week I'll do the Irish and their contributions. And there was an Irish community here. There was the Bosque, certainly a Bosque community. And you could almost pick every different nationality. But there was just, oh, a little side note. I remember at one of the exhibits for the Italian, Gerd Giordano, you know, you can tell, Swedish. And she comes up to me and says, Aaron, maybe your next book will be on the Swede Santa Barbara. <laughs> and as I'm processing this, she says, it'll be a very small book. <laughs> so I think the difference is, of course, every different nationality has produced and done productive things here, but seeing that the Italians weren't just busy, that there were so many of them, number one. Number two, that they were there as a group, as an ethnic group. And sometimes I've said to people, they're really our largest ethnic group identified. And people say, no, 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 that would probably be Mexican, because we have so many Mexico people and coming here from different times on, over the, you know, the century. And I said, but the difference is they don't, other than we had like Casa de la Raza, which was an ethnic gathering to come together, you didn't have gobs of people. The Italian boot club, when you have the Piedmontese group getting together, uh, these are huge numbers. Over the course of the century, you saw one of those pictures, they would have their annual thing at Stowe House, at Tucker's Grove, and you're talking 400, 500, 600 people, Italians, coming together to identify, having the flag, singing the songs. Even not too long ago, 15 years ago, by the way, I was made one of my proudest achievements, besides the A's on my report card and scholarships, was I was made <clears throat> an honorary lifetime member of the Italian American Boot Club. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, when I used to go to their barbecues, you'd still have the little old ladies that were still speaking the dialect, playing canasta on one of the boards. I mean, it was just such this ethnic festival and that they took care of each other over the whole century when they were here. They had their mutual benefit societies so that if something happened to a man and you didn't have enough insurance, this was the insurance that they paid into. We talked about the random child that Giordano's took care of. They just took care of one another. They didn't look to government. They didn't look to government handout. They just said, I do it on my own. We take care of ourselves. It was considered disgraceful to have to go on any kind of welfare. So if somebody was not up to par or something happened in the family, and you know, people would tell me about so-and-so 50 years ago, he was a ne'er-do-well, but we took care of those kids. So they were just looking after one another. They didn't need government to do that. And that to me is something about that whole enterprising spirit of you know, the classic American immigrant. And just to kind of finish, wait, do we have another finish? Are there any Craviotas in the house? How about Giordano's? <laughs> Giordano's, would anybody who's related to the Giordano stand up? Go ahead and stand up. Okay, this will take forever. Anybody from Riverola Canavesa, your family, stand up, just to see what happens. Riverola, stand up, stand up. You're already standing up, okay. How about Lenate Pozzola? You know who you are, the Maratis, the Bodianis, Botinis. Let's see who any of those standing up. How about Lake Como? And that includes spouses. So if you're related or you're married into somebody else, you could stand up. Lenate Pozzolo, Como, any of the, Como back there. Well, you all stand up, just keep standing up. Let's see how many of them are here. Okay, all these Italians. Borgatello, that's an Asti, that's okay. If you're Italian, that area, let's Borgatello stand up. Asti and Susa, stand up. Genoa area, you stand up. Where's all my Crispani? There's gotta be 5,000 of you. Oh, there goes a whole bunch. 
Y'all stand up. I want to see all the Italians stand up. Where's all of our native sons? I mean, are you standing upstairs in the theater? You get to stand up too. Applaud your friends up there. Alrighty, and that concludes my Arrivederci.